boat. Didn't I construct his dwelling according to God's code? Lord gave him a red tag and that house it was condemned. Satan huffed and Satan puffed. Satan huffed and Satan puffed. And it will not rise again. Don't build. Don't build your house of sticks. Don't build. Don't build your house of sticks. Don't build. Don't build your house of sticks or Satan will blow it down. He'll blow it There was another sinner who finally saw the light. Built himself a house of bricks upon the highest height. That house passed God's inspection, it followed his true plan. Satan huffed and Satan puffed. 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 That house in eternal stands. So build your house of bricks. So build your house of bricks. Good morning, Austin, and welcome to the Atheist Experience. Uh, they weren't singing about us four. Uh, they were saying three <laughs> centers there, so they weren't talking about us four. That's the Austin Lounge Lizards. Just try something a little different each day, but you never know what you're going to hear on Sunday mornings here on Atheist Experience. Uh, let everybody know this is live January 15th, and we usually start out with a few announcements of the group Atheist Community of Austin. And I uh, uh, just want to remind everyone our next blood drive is Saturday, January 23rd at Texas Regional Blood Center and they're open from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. on that Saturday and we really like uh, the atheists there sh sharing our good deeds there with Austin and one of them is they're sharing our blood with you so we'd be glad to there uh, our lecture series continues on the first Sunday of every month there and the next one is February 7th and it'll be Steve Bratton speaking on evolution in reverse that's such a curious title. I'm curious to see what... <laughs> I don't know what that's going to be. Uh, that'll be real good. Uh, <clears throat> and then I also want to announce uh, A Atheist Community of Austin is sponsoring Free Thought Roundup. This will be April 2nd through the 4th. It's a national convention of the Atheist Alliance, and we're holding it here in Austin. And we're real proud to do that. And Don and Mary Sue have been doing a great job on that so far. And we'll keep you up to date on that. We've got a lot of great speakers. And that gives me a chance to remind everyone, uh, the Ray Romano that we are having <laughs> as a, is not the same one that's on TV. I, I mentioned that something a couple weeks ago. And uh, he's definitely not the same guy. But he does a great little play there on, called Judas. And I'm looking forward to meeting the guy in person there. And speaking of uh, corrections there, it gives me a chance to make corrections. And you guys can... Uh, go along with this. Uh, the gentleman that called and said something about China having 200 million in the army. I did the research on the internet, and according to the 1997 census, which is the last one that was available on this webpage, there's 195 active military in the Chinese army, which is pretty damn close to 200 million. I'll admit that. But to finish the the point, though, there they actually said in reserves and. Uh, I don't know what how what would qualify as available, but they said they had almost 350 available for their armed services. So uh, they had 350 million. So I had no idea that there. And I said that China had. There was no way China had 200 million. So I learned something new. So I'm thankful. <laughs> but it no way validates that prophecy. And you guys can go along with that, won't you? That just. Well, yeah, you, you said some excellent first points. First of all, by, the, by those numbers, they passed 200 million a long time ago. And secondly, as the population of the Earth expands, um, inevitably some country is going to get 200 million men in its army. And since the Bi all the Bible says is east, that could be any place on the planet. You know, a country just west uh, could be east if you go around the Earth far enough. So uh, it's still uh, essentially meaningless. Uh, I did want to. But, wanna but he had his numbers right. Yes. I, so I did want to. Let let you know I'm willing to learn something new every week there. So, uh, and we love hearing from your callers. This is January 15th. Just remind everybody we'll be taking your calls live here on the air shortly. Uh, the one of the news little thing that I had was Arthur C. Clarke came out this week and said enough is enough. The millennium does not start till January 1st, and it's 2001. It's not 2001 because we didn't say 1,900 when we hit 1,900. 
<laughs> and we're not going to say 2,100 when we hit 2,100. So it's actually 2,000. And i got to break myself of that habit, too. And I see lights, so we can call it. But we have some other things here. Jeff, got a couple of news things. Oh. And then we'll get to this week's guest. Uh, excellent guest this week. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting uh, report on CNN. Um, researchers have uh, managed to make a a machine out of DNA that uh, responds to commands and does a little motion on command. Um, it says uh, the, the, uh, this is a step toward building tiny machines that could someday perform intricate jobs like building computer circuits and clear, uh, clearing clogged blood vessels in the brain. The hinge-like part which bends on Q is just four ten thousandths of the width of a human hair. This isn't the first time scientists have turned chemical compounds into moving parts, but previous examples have been ham hampered by their floppy nature. <laughs> the DNA device, however, is particularly rigid and executes motions ten times bigger, the researcher uh, Nadrian C. Seaman said. The device is, was made by joining two double-strand DNA spirals with a brittle <coughs> DNA. When it's exposed to a particular chemical solution, the part, uh, part of the structure bends. The findings were reported in Thursday's journal, uh, Thursday's issue of the journal Nature. The team hopes to eventually build other moving parts using DNA, including arms and fingers that could someday be mounted on a micro robot. Uh, this is the latest twist in the fledgling field of nanotechnology, or technology at the atomic scale. Our, uh, K. Eric Drexler of the Institute for Molecular Manufacturing in Los, An Los An Altos, California, Agreed that Siemens device is too cumbersome to be useful, but he said further development may lead to practical devices. I just thought that was kind of neat. I want, uh, and the first thing that occurred to me was that they could actually use that to repair DNA. It seemed like and possibly build a machine that would go yeah, in and yeah, repair. The, the goal is to make um, molec uh, make molecules function like robots. Right. You know, the way you stick molecules together like tinker toys uh, until you get something with parts that move the way you want them to, and then. Uh, and then give them instructions and have them move around like little robots and, and do work at the uh, level of atoms. That's fantastic. But it, uh, let me in, uh, reintroduce John Coons and Jim Halmack. I'm sorry. I, I, I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. I, I, I know my voice really sounds crap this morning. Uh, <laughs> they're both science teachers. And uh, so uh, today's topic is going to be evolution. And I see uh, we have one color on the line. Uh, hang in there for a few minutes. I want to get into the topic here, and then we'll, if that's all right with you guys, that's right? Fine, yeah. All right. And uh, I'll just hand it over to John. All right. You're going to start, John? Right. right. Uh, what I was going to talk about was uh, the subject of evolution. This is a subject that's extremely important, and it's one of the most important ideas in science, but it's also one of the most misunderstood ideas. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions, there's a lot of misinformation about how evolution works, and what it does, and what it is, and what it isn't. And I thought what we could do is try to clear up some of those misunderstandings. Uh, what we have here on, the, on our handy uh, uh, easel. easel, thank you, <laughs> yeah, the thing was called, the easel, easel. easel. Yeah, the, yeah, if we could have an easel shot, we have here something that will uh, lead into a good discussion of where science uh, shows us how evolution yeah. works, but there's also misunderstandings about it. Well, Way when the easel back. comes up, uh, I, I will, we'll talk about it. On the easel, there's a picture of a number <laughs> of different ancestors. There we, go. Uh, there we go. There's a number of different ancestors to modern man. One of the misconceptions about evolution is that this sequence right here is, uh, is uh, this step-by-step -step process that leads inevitably to us, and that's not true. Uh, there's nothing to indicate that our species is end result of millions of years of evolution. Our species is one small twig on what you could picture uh, as a bush of, of living organisms and species over time. So these particular organisms right here are not necessarily our ancestors. Some of these would be side branches that did not lead to anything that's alive today. So that, that's a, a common mis misunderstanding and people expect to find a missing link as if there's a, a, a continual sequence of, of human ancestors all the way back. and we just, every single fossil we find is going to fit in there someplace. It's just simply not that way. Uh, the next picture we have, you want to grab that one? Thanks. The next picture we have is uh, kind of the big picture of, of evolution. And another misunderstanding about evolution, maybe we can get a 
camera shot on that. Uh, one of the misunderstandings about evolution is people have a hard time understanding the vast amounts of time that's involved in, in the process of evolution in the history of the, the planet Earth. Um, one of the things I used to do at school was in teaching seventh grade, I would take uh, the kids and, and each give each kid uh, three pieces of graph paper with a quarter inch uh, uh, rule uh, lines on it and have them put a dot on every intersection between the lines. And if I had a hundred and some odd kids and I had each one do two and a half to three pages, I can't remember the numbers, but we would end up with a book of one million dots. And this timeline right here shows the history of, of, of the planet Earth and it starts down here with 4,500 million years ago. That's, that would be uh, 4,500 of these books that were turned out to be like 250 pages long, packed full of dots. So the history of the Earth is extremely long, and when you're talking about all this change, and you wonder how did you, how could it possibly have started out with simple cells, and then end up with something as complex as a human being, and one one block to understanding that is having a hard time understanding the vast amount of time involved. But as this chart shows, the, the most uh, most of the history of the Earth is actually dominated by single cell organisms. And I've heard it said, and you know, they, they, they call different times the age of mammals or the age of reptiles or whatever. But really, th the truth is, this and every other time before this has always been the age of bacteria. Bacteria <laughs> are the single most successful group, uh, although it's a very varied group, very successful group that has, has been around for a very long time and will probably be around for a very long time. Most of the history of the life on Earth is single cell organisms. It was not until some 750 to 1,000 million years ago that we had any multicellular organisms. That's animals or plants with more than one cell. And then after that, it was still quite a while before we had anything recognizable. It wasn't until 530 million years ago that the major phyla that exist now, that's the major groupings of animals and plants, uh, were pretty much there. And then what's happened in the last 530 million years is basically modifications to a basic pattern, a basic body type that, that has been in existence. And that leads up through the age of fish and the age of reptiles and, and, and mammals. Those are all basically variations on a very uh, simple theme. So, But I'm going to go on to the next picture here, which talks about the, the basics of natural selection, another misunderstood idea. Natural selection, very s simple idea. Like a lot of good ideas, it's also very relatively simple. And when, once it was kind of written down, people looked at that and thought, wow, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> uh, of course, when it was originally written down by Charles Darwin, he did not understand, uh, Charles Darwin did not understand genetics uh, at all. Uh, that, was a, that was a science that was just coming into being. And he was not really uh, up on that. But basically, it works like this. Uh, there are more offspring born than can possibly survive long enough to reproduce. And anybody that's ever had a dog or a cat that's had uh, uh, puppies or kittens, then you know that, that, that there'll be three or four kittens born. And that cat can reproduce a number of times during the year and quite a few times during its lifetime. If all those kittens were to live and they had kittens and, and on and on, before very many years, the entire planet uh, would be covered with kittens and there would be no place for 200 million Chinese <laughs> army people. <laughs> <laughs> they would have to leave the planet. Well, you know, uh, they gotta eat. Well, that's, that's true. They <laughs> really eat the kittens too. <laughs> <laughs> kittens too. Kitten chow mein. <laughs> well, anyway. So, number two, there is a variation among the offspring. There's always differences between different organisms, and, and anybody that you know has brothers or sisters can <coughs> see that for themselves. You just look at your brother or sister, and unless you're an identical twin, which is kind of a different case, basically there's a lot of variation. And number three, most, much of the variation will be caused by genetic recombinations. Uh, we know that we inherit traits. Darwin didn't know that. He didn't really understand this point. And he, and he realized at his time, and actually wrote in his book on the origin of species, that his, he knew what his biggest stumbling block was for his theory of natural selection was um, figuring out how traits were inherited. Uh, he, he thought that they were blended, that somehow if you had parent A and parent B and they had offspring C, then you know, those traits for whatever would be somehow combined and blended together. But now we know that those traits are, are inherited more in discrete 
packages and genes. He didn't really understand that. Uh, but anyway, most, of, most variation is caused by genetic recombinations. And then the last thing to natural selection is just that the traits that allowed some of the offspring to survive are going to be passed along to the next generation. And what those traits are, are not necessarily uh, being uh, big and strong or vicious or having sharp teeth. A lot of times uh, natural selection is confused with the term survival of the fittest and, right. and uh, you know, which has sometimes been used by people to justify uh, various acts of cruelty to other people on the on the basis that hey you know what I was I was bigger I was tougher and I was there and they didn't so they didn't make it so forget them but that's not really what natural selection is about uh, one trait that might allow you to survive long enough to have offspring and give you an, an edge over your competition might be uh, even helping it being altruistic uh, there's there's plenty of evidence to show that uh, that altruism what we think of as being helpful which you wonder why now why would that get passed along genetically well one of the ways it can be passed along is when you for organisms that are altruistic that live in communities that help each other that does help the individual survive because they create a situation where they have a better chance of surviving that that particular individual uh, so chimpanzees for instance live in communities where they help each other out uh, to some extent and and so do we so yeah, you want, the caller's been on there about 15 minutes. Yeah, why don't, minutes? We, go ahead, why don't we go sure. ahead and take a break here? Sure. Thanks. Uh, Matt? Yes. Thanks, thanks for holding. You have a question here for John? Yeah. John, how are you doing? Hi, how are you doing? I just woke up a little bit earlier. I just wanted to say one thing. God rules baldy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for holding for that long there, Matt. We appreciate that. <laughs> this is January 15th. We are live on the air, and we will take your questions. Seventeenth. Right? Oh, I don't know why it said the fifteenth. I said that twice, didn't I? You should have. Yes, I'm sorry about that, folks. Sunday, uh, the fifteenth was Friday, <laughs> and today is Sunday, the seventeenth. And we will take your calls live on the air. As you can see, we'll take anyone's calls. It seems like. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, thanks for that interruption there. Well, that's uh, that's the basics of natural selection and. Uh, what we thought we would do is, at this, at this point, let Jim take over and talk about some of the, the, the molecular level of, of evolution. Take that down. Where, yeah, the down. Recap, where the genetic right. change actually takes place. Uh, John was right when he said that, uh, of course, Charles Darwin really didn't know much about the, the mechanism for uh, how natural selection would, would occur. Uh, back in that day, they did not have the technology to um, know what traits were or even wh what exactly were uh, the genes that caused uh, different uh, appearances or different uh, features that a living organism might have. Of course, today, um, scientists have gone to the point of actually uh, being able to break down and even construct the, the, probably the most important biological molecule, that being DNA. And what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes talking about uh, exactly what do we know about DNA, what is it made out of, and how does that eventually lead to um, Darwin's ideas about uh, evolution and the, f the fact of evolution as we know it today? If you take a look up here, uh, just a real simple diagram of exactly what is DNA. It is a double-stranded uh, st structure where the strands, for the most part, are attached to one another. Uh, the components of the strands uh, are three. We have something called a phosphate ribose backbone which is simply some sugar molecules and uh, a chemical called phosphate which are linked together to form a backbone throughout the uh, double helix. And then the rings of the ladder, as it's oftentimes referred to, actually are, are made out of uh, four uh, nitrogen-based um, molecules called cytosine, uh, guanine, adenine, and thymine, thymine. And as you can see that these different molecules are attached to one another uh, to form this rather um, uh, solid uh, structure, the, the, the two bands, uh, the two strands uh, working together. Now what this particular picture shows is that in the process of going from one cell to two, uh, cells need to duplicate their DNA. If not, when a cell divides either in normal growth or let's say in the production of sperm or eggs, the amount of uh, DNA will decrease in half at every step. Uh, that, of course, cannot occur. 
So one of the steps is the, what's referred to as the replication of DNA. And it's really quite fascinating how it works. What happens is there are some protein molecules or enzymes inside the uh, cells that actually unzip the double strand. And when the two strands are unzipped, uh, we now have space available for new nitrogen bases to kind of sneak in with the base that is complementary to them. Uh, as it turns out, adenine and thymine form a strong bond together, and guanine and cytosine form a strong bond. So when these two strands unzip, we now have uh, spaces available for new uh, molecules to come in. And as they come in, the, you will notice that we go from one strand or one single cr DNA molecule, which is double-stranded, to two single-stranded, and then the, as the molecules come in, we end up replicating the DNA, going from one to two, which of course is a must for any cell that wants to divide. Uh, with this knowledge in hand, scientists have then later figured out, so what does this exactly mean as far as what we look like, our physical traits, our characteristics? Um, and that brings it up to the next level of synthesis, which is how proteins are made. Uh, DNA basically is the instructions for uh, proteins, and proteins are extremely important um, biological molecules. They uh, make up our structure of bodies. They also uh, make up virtually all the enzymes inside living things that cause chemical reactions to occur that keep us alive. The proteins themselves come from the DNA instructions. And this rather complicated diagram, and I'll try to summarize it the best I can, show how proteins are produced. We start up here with a piece of DNA, which, as I mentioned earlier, becomes unzipped. And when it's in its single-stranded form here, there's another molecule very closely related to DNA called RNA. Well, the DNA acts as a template for the construction of a long strand called uh, of messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA basically transfers the information from inside the nucleus of a cell outside into the cytoplasm of a cell. This messenger RNA leaves the nucleus through a pore and attaches itself to a structure called a ribosome. That ribosome is basically a factory for making proteins. With the messenger, messenger RNA instructions got from the DNA, now the cell can start making proteins. The uh, RNA attaches itself to the ribosome and now we have what are called uh, amino acids, which is the basic building block of proteins. Those amino acids are carried by another type of RNA into a particular spot on the ribosome. And to kind of summarize this, because it is a very involved process, the instructions from the DNA are transferred to the RNA, and the instructions on the RNA dictate what proteins will be built, the exact order of the amino acids, how long they are, how short they are, even to the extent once the protein is separated from the ribosome, how that, rib how that protein will fold into its final configuration that allows it to function as it does. Uh, rather involved, complicated process. I uh, hope my little summary but, uh, <laughs> opened up have some doors. Science has spent a lot of time and effort, and, and they're not done yet. That's uh, not the fun. They don't know everything. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it'd be foolish to state that this is uh, unequivocally the uh, exact way in which it works. Uh, undoubtedly, there are some components that uh, are still yet to be discovered, and uh, as long as scientists keep working at it, eventually I'm, I hope they'll get there. That might be a good time to mention what the word theory means. Exactly. Uh, yeah, go right ahead. You want me to that? You want to take it? Jump in. Uh, the word theory, when it's used properly in science, does not mean the same thing that uh, we mean it by when we're talking in everyday language. The word theory in science is something different. The word theory um, is an explanation just about anywhere you see the word theory in science, you can cross that out and you can write the word explanation. Scientific theories uh, build on each other. They, uh, they are explanations for observations or facts that we see in the universe around us. And theories, of course, can change over time as we get new and better facts. And this is a perfect example right here, which is what made me think of it. Um, DNA wasn't even known about in Darwin's day. So his theory of natural selection started out uh, missing some information. Now our understanding of natural selection involves all this about DNA and RNA and, and, uh, and proteins and amino acids. And 50 years from now there will be new information that will make some of what we understand now obsolete. And to a lot of people that's uh, upsetting that people want to have 
very black and white, yes, no, yeah. this is the truth, this isn't the truth. And in science, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, any scientific idea, every scientific idea, including natural selection, is subject to being tested, and, and if there was enough evidence to throw it out, it would have to be thrown out. The fact is, there isn't enough evidence, but or any evidence, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, but uh, that's how science works. So I thought oh. I'd, I'd ought to throw that in there. So you okay. want to try another call? Let's take yeah, one. Yeah, sure. Let's sure. go ahead and do that. All right, we got one. John. What the hell is on here? He used a different name. Yeah. It was the same guy, man. He used a different name. But notice the names he chooses. Matthew, John. Oh, yeah, I had noticed that. Yeah, well, let's look for <laughs> Luke here coming <laughs> next. For Deuteronomy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have, I've got a couple of questions. Sure. Um, Just mind, everybody, this is January 17th. We are taking questions live on the air. And Jeff, uh, go going ahead. Going back to what you were saying earlier, uh -huh. John, um, you mentioned that the most successful uh, uh, type of life that we have is... Uh, is uh, uh, I forget what word bacteria. Microbes, bacteria. 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 Yeah. bacteria. Um, uh, I often often hear the criticism of evolution that uh, if evolution was happening, we wouldn't have any more bacteria <laughs> because all the bacteria <laughs> would have been selected against, and you would have only the more complicated things. Why is that not the case? For one thing, more complicated things like us require bacteria. You live in. We all live in. Uh, a symbiotic relationship with bacteria. So we depend on them and they depend upon us. They live inside our intestines and our, our digestive tract, they're mm -hmm. on our skin. Uh, they provide uh, vitamins that we need. That's right. Uh, there was a good article in National Geographic not long ago about all the different things that, that live on people's skin that people would tend to think of as being simple and maybe should have been gone by now, should have been worked out of the system. But the fact is they're an important part of the whole ecology. So is it, is it symbiotic? Do they have to yeah. get some benefit from our existence mm -hmm. too? They have a place to live, and we have. <laughs> we have so, so not, uh, you know, if you have if you have some kind of bacteria and and some of them evolve, it's only some of them, right? And right. Bacteria cover a wide region, and, right. and evolution is not happening constantly on every single member of a species the same, and no matter where it is and what conditions it's under. Right, and and that also touches on another misconception that evolution is this constant. Uh, building up of organisms to be like people <laughs> and to be big and complicated and that's not that's not really what happens uh, if, if, if you're a bacteria and you're, you're being very successful about reproducing and, and such then you won that, that's it that, that's the end point right there and that it's and that life form will maintain as right. long as they're uh, well, the environment doesn't right. change exactly, exactly. <coughs> that, and, and there's and, and generally what happens when environments change is organisms move they they move move with the environment, right. and when when new species come about, uh, generally what happens is it happens on the edges of that. It's kind of a, a thing that happens on the side where there's some small group of organisms that are kind of separated from the rest, the main group, and then that's where that's where the speciation occurs. And if you have an organism that, for example, can't move when the environment changes, uh, the oddballs within that population, the ones that just happen to be born with uh, certain traits that allow them to survive in that new environment, well, guess what? They survive, and the rest of the population uh, may very well perish. And it's just an example of how uh, characteristics can change within a population when the environment changes. Because those that were fortunate enough to be born with characteristics that allow them to uh, survive in this new environment, they, they survive. And of course, then they pass those traits on to their offspring as well. Yeah. So, excellent. Uh, Definitely enjoy it. Uh, so what, what should we, what okay. should we hit well, next? Well, let, let me continue. continue. Yeah, I wasn't sure which one you were going to. <laughs> well, what does this mean as in, in terms of evolution goes? I mean, um, we have a lot of evidence for evolution based on geology, based on uh, the anatomy. We can compare different structures and different organisms and see what on the surface seems to tell a story of how uh, organisms have changed over time. But we can also see lots and lots of evidence of that at the biological, or actually at the level of the uh, of chemicals, of molecules. Here is just one of literally thousands of examples how uh, humans are related to other primates. Uh, what this diagram shows is that if we take a look at one portion of a protein that is so important to all life, the protein hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is actually made out of four smaller proteins that are that fit together. Um, two of those uh, four are called the alpha chains and two are called beta chains. Well, if, 
scientists have got to the point now where we can actually break down the exact sequence <coughs> of many proteins. Uh, proteins are simply long chains of amino acids. Scientists have done exactly that for these different primates shown up on the board. Uh, humans, gorillas, gibbons, and then uh, chimpanzees and some uh, other primates as well. Well, if you compare amino acid to amino acid to amino acid in this particular protein, humans and chimpanzees have the exact same sequence of amino acids, and I believe there's 146. This is a chain of 146 amino acids in this particular protein. Uh, humans and chimpanzees, exactly the same, 146 in the exact same order. Um, strong suggestion, of course, that humans and chimpanzees are more related than humans are to any of these other organisms or primates up here. Gorillas uh, only have one difference in that 146 amino acid chain, whereas gibbons, which uh, both on the surface is looking at the gross anatomy, are likely more different than chimpanzees, gorillas, and humans. Uh, also at the biochemical level, they have three differences out of this chain of 146. And then if you look at some of the more distantly, distantly related primates, you'll see even greater and greater difference in the chain uh, of amino acids that go into this molecule. Again, just another biochemical evidence of uh, the fact of evolution. Unless we have a number yeah, of Yeah, uh, we had, uh, okay, is it our Joe, I wonder. Uh, Joe? Hello. Yeah, this is Joe Zemecki. Hey, How Joe. you doing, Joe? Doing okay. Warmed up a little bit today, and I uh, think I might ride my bike around town. <laughs> Well, we, of course, we, it's 70 some here. Isn't yeah, it? it's supposed yeah. to be in the 70s today here. 70. Yes. That's so great. Uh, we have John Coons and Jim Halmack on today discussing evolution. Yeah. Yes. Ooh. So, uh, uh, any questions or highlights you'd like to fill us in? Well, uh, let's see. I don't know. I didn't have. I didn't. I just found out what the topic is. I don't know exactly. Okay. I don't have much on that. I, I did have one thing I wanted to. We were sent recently a, a pamphlet from a church. And this is Bible Believers Evangelistic Association Incorporated in Sherman, Texas. And it's a tribulation map by Leon Bates. And it's a pamphlet, basically, that has a kind of a timeline of the tribulation. And I don't know if you've seen Time Magazine recently. No. The newest issue. No. You should pick it up. It's They're having something about tri the tribulation there? Or? The end of the world. And yeah. it's got a drawing of a, you know, uh, a guy wearing one of those sandwich signs that says, the end of the world is near, you know, and uh, it's really sensationalizing it, but uh, this pamphlet actually goes and makes a color timeline, and it starts off with the first date here, 1967, Israel regained the temple site in Jerusalem. <laughs> yes. And then the 1973 energy crisis is the next timeline part here, and then, the, then it jumps all the way to 1991, the Gulf War, World Coalition of Global Communities setting stage for New World Order coming during the Tribulation. And then it starts a period where the rapture of the saved, and then it goes to a three and, what, and a half year what, date for that? Yeah, that's what I was yeah. going to ask too, Joe. What's that? Is there a date for the rapture? No, and there is oh. an asterisk at the bottom of this that says, note, this shows judgment content only, not sequence or time <laughs> of occurrence. <laughs> okay? That's funny. But Go ahead, I'm sorry. First three and a half years is uh, a, prior, a period of tribulation judgments where there's a period called the seals, and the seals judgments... Peace taken, global war, great weapons, Revelation 6, 4. Famine of days, food for a day's wages, uh, again, Revelation. The whole thing goes off of Revelation. And then there's earthquakes, the sun darkens, stars will fall, and mountains and islands will be moved. Panic and terror will be universal. And then there's the trumpets period, the trumpet judgments. Hail and hail, fire falls, mingled with blood. One third in the sea destroyed, fish, ships, and crews. Many will die from bitter poisoned water, sun smitten, Affecting light and sun smitten, <laughs> the sun will die. Affecting light and temperature, yeah, it'll affect the light and temperatures, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Demonic creatures torture unsaved people. Another one-third of the world's population will die. More great earthquakes and great hail. Then the bowls, B-O-W-L-S, bowl judgment. Malignant sores plagued all over the unsaved, Revelation 16, 12. Sea becomes blood. All on the seas will die. Only blood to drink from rivers and springs. Men scorched with fire and great heat, men without the sun. Men gnaw tongues due to pain and sores. Pre preparation for battle of Armageddon, greatest earthquake since men on the earth. Cities throughout the world will crumble. Every island and mountain will disappear. Huge hailstorms fall in about a, about 100 pound hailstorms, I mean the hailstones. 
And each one of these problems apparently can be found in Revelation. Uh, okay, then the, the next three and a half years, uh, the Antichrist moves into a temple, and then there's a return of Christ in glory, and then there's a green section where it says kingdom. That's all. <laughs> so okay. church age to kingdom over seven years. And uh, Time Magazine has that article. I'm going to read that today in the Time Magazine, but the cover is just amazing, the artwork. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely have to check it out. I, I, it's amazing that Time would... Uh, Ed would actually waste any time on that, uh, waste any of their uh, print on that. So, but well, always good to hear from you. Anything else? Yeah, the uh, blood drive now. You still, I, I realize I'm not there to sell yeah, it anymore. Yeah, I announced it January 23rd. Great, and I can't go down there and give blood, actually. I'm probably going to do that up here. And yeah, start one up there, yes. Good idea. Go for it. Anyway, uh, I guess that was about it. All right. Uh, uh, you going to make it back for a convention April 2nd, maybe? I'm going to try, but chances are we're going to have to work our convention up here. Oh, I, I, I just gave me a chance to plug our uh, uh, convention again. So <laughs> April oh, wow, 2nd through the 4th, it definitely, right. we're getting a lot of response on that. It should be definitely good. You want to plug your convention, Joe? Oh, well, you know, I, I wasn't attending on that, but, uh, right. yeah, it's the same weekend. Okay. And uh, But I looked at y'all's uh, mentioning of y'all's uh, convention and uh, the Atheist Alliance website. And, Thanks. Uh, they do a big page on it. It's really good, and apparently uh, y'all are going to have some really good speakers. Dan Barker and uh, one guy from California. Yes. And, uh, I'm looking forward to meeting Dan Barker in person. Uh, yeah. He sounds like a real interesting person. All right. Well, I guess that's about it, and uh, I'll try to call again next week. I appreciate your call. Thanks. Y'all have a good day, then. Bye, you have a great, great week. Later. All right. Well, hit that button. Uh, you want to try another call? We, uh, yeah. Go uh, ahead. Good. All right. Martha? Yes, hi, good morning. Good morning. I um, wanted to ask your guests if they have any knowledge about, uh, I'm hearing just little bits and pieces about medical changes that we're going through, things like uh, the spleen is now becoming worthless. Um, I actually heard something that there were actually people now being born without tonsils. Um, do you know anything about this? I That's mean, I news to I me, but like I say, we got excellent guests. That, well, there's, there's always going to be people born with and without things or with all kinds of variation. That's that's what we're talking about, um, there being a lot of variation in any population. That's that's just going to happen. Uh, but it, it's not true to say that people are going to start to be born without uh, whatever spleens or whatever because we don't use them or something like that. That, that simply isn't how evolution works. Uh, evolution ha it selects four uh, structures. Uh, it is true that some organisms like cave fish, for instance, have lost their color over many generations living in, in streams, but it's not because they didn't need the color. It's because any any changes like that that came up, any variations that came up where a cave fish was spawned without any skin color, um, that had, an, in, a, in a total darkness, it would have an equal chance of living uh, as, uh, along with a colored cave fish. And that genetic drift in a small population that will eventually, those those uh, what am I trying to say? Those uh, mutations will uh, will add up in the population, and, and that's what the population will basically become. But in, in a human population, uh, a lot of people look for for evolution in human populations, but most evolutionary change happens in small populations on the fringes of, of the of the big picture for for a species. Uh, there's six billion people on the planet right now and there won't be any real evolutionary change occurring there has to be um, there has to be a lot of people dying off first yeah. I mean typi typically you have an isolated community that is subject to some type of environmental pressure and uh, once isolated uh, the environmental pressure can have a greater effect on that particular population uh, and which may very well lead to um, changes significant yeah. enough to form a new species or a new variation uh, within a species. So, too, I mean, if you take a look at humans, where, I mean, where, where can you find an isolated humans nowadays? I mean, it's virtually impossible to find that. So, John's point about uh, that being less likely, I, I, I have to agree with. Uh, and on, on top of that, you've got to remember that human beings have technology, and if there were serious changes to our environment, you know, if it got a lot hotter, <coughs> well, we just have a lot more air conditioning, you know, <laughs> if, we, if it got a lot colder, we would go inside nice warm homes. Um, we change our our environment that we experience a whole lot faster than our DNA can change to 
to take in, uh, to to uh, to uh, respond to the changes in, in the environment itself. Um, if so it's hard to see where the selection pressure would come from to make tonsils go away when we have simple surgical procedures and antibiotics that keep people from having tonsil problems. The other the other thing is uh, there's less people with tonsils compared to when because <laughs> they didn't keep records on this kind of stuff uh, until very recently. If you look at the history of medicine, it's pretty bleak even 100 years ago. You would not want to go back in time 100 years ago and have a, any kind of medical problem because most of the time the doctor, you know, you were better off without having a doctor look at you. A lot of times <laughs> the people that went to the doctor died because of the bleeding and things that they did to them. So there really aren't any good records to show that kind of trend anyway over, long, over the big picture, over the long haul. Excellent question, Martha. Okay. Anything else? No, nope. that was that was it. So, so I just kind of want to clarify, make sure I understand. Sure. So what you're saying is, if these changes started happening and the people were like isolated on an island, right. then maybe this would be something that could start to become a trend. But because we've got so many other genetic factors coming in, that that kind of change can't really happen that, that's that about quickly. It. That's good a, overall summary. Yeah, that's a very good summary. Uh, okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. You guys have a great week. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Excellent call, and she stayed on the topic. Yes. Uh, you want to try one more? Sure. John? <laughs> What's the <that> one? <coughs> okay. It's supposed to be Luke this time. Uh, <laughs> you want to go to Mike? Or, yeah, let's go to Mike. Mike? Hey, good morning. Good morning, Mike. Great show. Great show. It gets better and better every week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike, that kind of stole my thunder uh, a little bit. My question was more or a comment, I don't know what you would want to call it, it's kind of along her lines, and I understand what y'all are saying, but for instance, I, um, I've i always looked at wisdom teeth as kind of evolution in progress. I mean, and, and you, and you at, uh, the guy sitting on the left-hand side of my television in, in the blue shirt with the blonde hair, yes, mm -hmm. um, you said uh, spleens were, or tonsils are uh, uh, less as opposed to, to what? Um, I, just in my own experience, uh, not that I go around and ask, pe ask people, hey, do you have your wisdom teeth or did they come in? But in the few times that that subject has come up, I've run across a lot more people that don't have wisdom teeth and not because they were pulled than people who do have wisdom teeth and or had them pulled. Do you see what I'm saying? I, so and this is your, only per your own personal survey. You know, uh, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, so I've never heard of any I uh, statistics or evidence to, uh, no. to go along with that. I've never heard anything on the subject of wisdom teeth in regards to natural selection or evolution. Uh, th there, you know, there may be, and even if there was some kind of trend in a small scale, it wouldn't necessarily mean that it's uh, happening on a worldwide population either. Uh, uh, Okay, well, cool. Just kind of blew my my thought, but okay, okay. it still works. A excellent question. Have a good Thank day. you. Something to look into. Yeah, yeah, I have statistics that. because then if there was a change, we would have to figure out what the selection pressure is that that's yeah. weeding out um, the the genetic lines that have wisdom teeth and tonsils. Uh, one I've heard, and maybe you've heard, that, suppose that our little finger is getting smaller. As I've heard that, <laughs> I've heard that story. Yeah. I, I, and I, I, don't. I think it's just another example of the. Uh, Misconceptions, uh, misconceptions right. towards how humans may, if at all, uh, be changing over time. Right. Um, I mean, it's commonly thought that there's a selective pressure for humans to get taller. If you go back and look at uh, ancient archaeological, I hate that word just like you do, <laughs> uh, archaeological sites. Uh, if you go back and look at skeletons, it seems that uh, go back uh, 300, 400, 1,000 years, everyone was a lot shorter. Yeah. And a lot of people want to say that people are evolving to get taller. Well, in fact, it's more than likely just due to improvements in nutrition over the last thousands of years that allow for the human bodies to, on average, read a, a reach a more, uh, uh, more measurable, a taller height. So, yeah, our you can see that on a much shorter time scale looking at Japanese people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, their diet is a lot more varied, mm -hmm. particularly Japanese people who move away from Japan and start eating other diets, um, growth that's all in place. Exactly. Interesting. Well, uh, at this point, uh, I give a chance to do a break. I, I want to do one quick announcement, and I'll let Jeff do a little series here about uh, uh, critical thinking, if you guys don't mind. Oh, I think we have some break. But uh, I do want to make uh, David John Coons is going to be with the uh, Secular Humanist Group in Austin. Houston. 
I said Austin, didn't I? I'm, lo I'm looking right at Houston. <laughs> it says Houston. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, excuse me in there. I'm coughing on the air, too. It's in Houston, Saturday, February 20th. And it's a Darwin Day celebration, an all-day event to be held at Borders Books. And uh, it's still in the planning, but uh, it's going to feature four speakers, and John Coons is going to be one of them. And I, there's a list of the other three. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention that out there that uh, John does an excellent job on uh, evolution and, and loves getting out there to the public and talking to it and taking questions. And you're doing a great job today, and I just wanted to remind everybody about that little bit that's going on in Houston. Thank in case you got friends or relatives that are in Houston and you might want, I, I don't think I'll be able to make it. I'd love to make it. But who's it? All right, and Jeff started a series here uh, cr yeah, on critical, think critical thinking. And uh, uh, just to recap, last week uh, we talked about falsifiability. Um, and to sum up, if a claim is phrased or defended in such a way as to make it impossible to conceive of evidence that would prove that would prove the claim false, then the claim is meaningless and unworthy of serious consideration. If the evidence would be the same whether the claim was true or not, then there's no way to tell whether it is true or not, and so why bother trying? Um, this week's critical thinking tip, comprehensiveness. The evidence offered in support of any claim must be exhaustive. That is, all of the available evidence must be considered. For obvious reasons, it is never reasonable to consider only the evidence that supports a theory and to discard the evidence that contradicts it. This rule is straightforward and self-apparent, and it requires little explanation or justification. Nevertheless, it is a rule that is frequently broken by proponents of supernatural claims and by those who adhere to supernatural beliefs. For example, when people believed that Jean Dixon had precognitive ability because she predicted the 1988 election of George Bush, which she did two months before the election when every social scientist, media maven, and <laughs> private citizen in the country was making the same, get, uh, the same claim, they typically ignore the thousands of forecasts that Dixon made which have failed to come true, such as her predictions that John F. Kennedy would not win, win the presidency in 1960, that World War III would begin in 1958, and that Fidel Castro would die in 1969. <laughs> if you're willing to be selective about the evidence that you consider, then you could reasonably conclude that the Earth is flat. But as straightforward as it appears to be, comprehensiveness can sometimes be difficult for the average person to evaluate. For one thing, people may suggest that unanswered questions about a claim constitute evidence against that claim, and then invoke the rule of comprehensiveness. This is frequently attempted by opponents of evolutionary theory, tying it into our subject here today, which uh, not even on purpose. Uh, in <laughs> fact, unanswered questions are merely that, unanswered. Open questions certainly indicate that more work remains to be done and may lead to the claim being modified or even discarded later. In the meanwhile, lack of knowledge about something cannot be considered evidence about that thing. So the existence of open questions does not violate the rule of comprehensiveness. Comprehensiveness is only violated if available evidence is ignored. Also, it's easy for anyone to come along and claim that some evidence exists which the other side is ignoring. To determine whether the cited evidence actually exists or not often requires one to be a specialist in the field or to spend a lot of time looking up references. Of course, one cannot simply say there is evidence that is not being considered without being specific about what that evidence is and expect to be taken seriously. On the other hand, if references are offered and you're not already familiar with them, you're obligated by the rule of comprehensiveness to go and look them up, at least if you really care about finding out the truth. Uh, next week, we'll talk about the rule of honesty, which states that the evidence offered in support of any claim must be evaluated without self-deception. Excellent. I, I appreciate it. And like I said, it tied in excellent with today's topic there. Uh, you want to go to you or you want to go to a call? Why don't we uh, sure. go through a few more of these panels? We're going to do some more on DNA here. Uh, Fantastic. In the same vein as I was talking about earlier, some of the evidence for uh, evolution and some of the relatedness between different primates. Uh, what we have here is an, a classic experiment actually done back in the 1960s, uh, which shows how similar the DNA is between humans and chimpanzees. And if I may just step aside for a moment, people who know evolution and study evolution do not say that we came from monkeys, which of, co which of course is a common uh, slam on yes. evolution. Uh, 
the evidence suggests that humans and chimpanzees shared common ancestors, but no, we did not come from chimpanzees, uh, despite what this might suggest if for people who don't know uh, the whole story. Uh, what scientists have been able to do is take DNA from humans and chimpanzees and heat them up. And if you heat the both DNA samples up to 86 degrees Celsius, the two strands actually separate. And we can, you can separate those two strands, remix them together, basically, and you can get hybrid human-chimpanzee DNA. In fact, if this further, if you look at this even in more detail, there's roughly 98% homology uh, between human and chimpanzee DNA. Uh, despite the outward physical differences, uh, at the DNA genetic level, we're virtually 98, 99% identical. Again, if that is not evidence for uh, uh, being related, I don't know what is. Uh, have, have they get so far to where in the orangutans, the closest? Uh, I've heard that. I'm, uh, yeah, please correct me if I'm wrong. Chimpanzees. I, chimpanzees. are the, okay, okay. And then gorillas, yeah. and then... Uh, gorillas, and then uh, the orangutans. older world monkeys and the new world monkeys. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, just another example, taking a look at structure of proteins. Uh, it's rather interesting. Uh, here are four types of proteins, and exactly what they are, what they do, is not all that important, other than, let me just go over a few of them. If we take a look at a protein called histone, it's a protein that's involved in keeping the DNA within the cells uh, uh, basically as compact as possible. It's a crucial protein uh, that allows the DNA to be stable and take up uh, less space within a cell. If you compare the histone proteins between humans and uh, distant their ancestor going up way back 90 million years ago, uh, horse, they're virtually identical. And that must be the case because this is a protein where you really can't uh, afford to have any changes. Any changes in this protein, even over 90 million years, will not become functional anymore and therefore that organism or population will, will perish. Uh, it's crucial that this stays the same over time, and indeed, it, ha it, is change uh, it is staying the same over time. Comparing that to the opposite extreme here, here's a particular protein called a fibrinopeptide. Uh, um, what it does is actually involved in the blood clotting process. This particular peptide, really the only function it serves is to act as a spacer. Before blood clotting occurs, this protein uh, is within this larger protein. And once a cut is uh, formed and blood needs to clot, that spacer molecule is removed so blood clotting can occur. The exact uh, sequence of the, the spacer molecule isn't all that important. In fact, all it does is fill up a gap. And if we take a look at this protein as far as comparing horse and human uh, uh, protein of this form, there's an 86% difference between them. And again, that's what you'd expect if there's really if the exact structure isn't important, uh, over time, changes are going to occur in that structure, and over 90 million years, we've got a difference of 86% between these two. So the very important proteins, the ones that really cannot change in order for an organism to survive, indeed don't change. If changes do occur, then that organism dies. Whereas proteins that uh, the exact sequence isn't important, uh, changes can occur there over time, with no detriment to that particular uh, animal. Well, if you don't mind, uh, uh, and it looks like th they're using that to gauge where the separation took place? Is well, that what you're showing at the What top? we have here basically is, is a type of a molecular clock where can, depending on the type of protein, whether it's one that absolutely cannot change or one that can be variable with no dire consequence to the animal, to the uh, organism, uh, as more and more changes occur, that can be used as a clock to go back in time when this original split did occur. Up at the top, they talk about about 90 million years ago, which is when some of the, uh, the larger different types of mammals seem to separate according to the geologic record. Uh, so over 90 million years, virtually no changes here, but 86% of the entire uh, protein in this example changes. Hey, that's something new. I did not. Thank you. It can be used as a clock. And then the final uh, plate I want to show you up here is one that uh, I'm sure a lot of our viewers have seen. Yes. Uh, although I don't know how many of them truly uh, appreciate the significance of this. What we have here is our diagrams of the various developmental stages uh, in the development of five uh, organisms, humans, monkeys, pigs, chickens, and salamanders. And if you go and take a look at the far left, which is a picture of basically the fertilized egg, 
Uh, they're virtually indistinguishable at that level, uh, aside from maybe some slight differences in size and, of course, the DNA within them. On the outward appearance, they're exactly the same. I take a look at the next stage, which is called a blastocyst. And again, this occurs in all five of these organisms. Again, they're very difficult to distinguish between one, uh, one from another. If you look at the third stage, when we start to see the embryo take some shape, uh, you try to tell the difference between a human and a monkey and even a pig embryo at this stage. They're virtually identical, uh, even to the formation of the arm buds, which will later develop into limbs. Uh, even at the later stage between humans and monkeys and pigs, they're virtually identical. And as we continue later on in the developmental process, we finally start seeing some of the differences. Of course, the most distantly related organism, that being salamander amphibians, which evolved uh, hundreds of millions of years ago, you'll start seeing differences there sooner than you will uh, with the, between the human and monkey, which are, uh, according to the evidence, uh, far more closely related than any of these are. Uh, what's also interesting is that in the human development, we actually form structures during our development that later disappear, structures that stay in other organisms. For example, uh, gill slits, which later in our development uh, turn into components of our ear. While in embryo, we have gill slits, gill slits that later on, at least in, in fish, remain to serve as their gills. Uh, we actually have in our development a little tail, uh, very similar to uh, the tail, of course, in the monkey and pigs and some of the other creatures here. And later on in development, that tail is reabsorbed back in the developing embryo. Uh, the, the common phrase that ontology, ontology, which is the development of a particular organism, uh, and phylogeny, which is the development of organisms through evolution are related, is shown in this diagram. Excellent. Yeah, you want to try to call now? Let's take it. All right, let's oh, go can see. Can you guys uh, hear me? Greg. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Hello? Gre yeah, go ahead, Greg. Arlo, we'll get you next, I promise. All right. Uh, go ahead, Greg. Greg? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Greg. Uh, my name's Ken. Oh, Ken, I'm Ken. sorry. Uh, yeah. Slight uh, miscommunication there, Ken. Yeah. All right. go, go right ahead. Welcome to the show. Hey, all right. Uh, great. A uh, little while ago, Jeff made a statement about having surgery to prevent tonsil problems from happening. That strikes me as uh, insane, okay? You don't uh, have surgery to prevent problems. You wait for the problems, and then you have surgery. Well, uh, uh, you, you did took it. Go ahead, Jeff, because yeah, he took it out of course, the Of course, statement. what I was getting at was people don't die from having tonsil problems. That was my point, right? Oh, okay. If people All right. are dying oh. from having tonsil problems, why then that could be a selection pressure uh, and you would wind up after a few generations with only people that didn't hit, either didn't have tonsils or didn't have the tonsil problem. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. You didn't, you didn't get the whole conversation oh. there. All right. Uh, any uh, other questions? Yeah, well, I just sure. want to say, say something here. You know, I've been watching your show uh, for, you know, a while now. And sure. Today it's a little bit different, but a lot, uh, most of the time you're always splitting hairs with religious people about religious issues. You know, and uh, I was wondering, you know, don't you have anything better to do? Uh, to well, that's what, like what we're doing today. We're trying to do better, <laughs> yeah. and right. you and you pointed it out. Yes. All right. Right. Now, uh, you know. Also, uh, you know, I was just hoping you could, you know, uh, you, you know, these religious arguments they can never be settled. You know, and uh, it just seems to be a total waste of time just to even argue about those things. Well, uh, we appreciate and, uh, your input, uh, uh, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, those those religious questions are often brought to us by uh, by callers. And then we, we respond to them. And it, you know, if it's if there are subtle enough things that to resolve them, you have to split hairs. Then that's what we do. And 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 that's usually happens when the callers don't stay on the topic, and you're not staying on the topic. <laughs> so, uh, uh, would you like anything else? Uh, that's it. All right, thank you. All right. <laughs> that's what happens. You know, the callers get off the topic, and we ended up with talking Bible prophecies or something. Man, we're supposed to be talking evolution. Man, man. Man. Let's go. On. Oh, yeah, Arlo, oh, I'm sorry, yes, well, Arlo. I, I just had, had a couple of questions sure. about the DNA. You're saying uh, there's a 98% similarity. Is Does that also go for inactive genes? Any coded information that's not being put to use? I, I hate that term, inactive genes, well, uh, myself. If, if, if you take a look at the entire uh, DNA within a living organism, uh, in fact, much of it is not known to, fo uh, to code or be instructions for proteins. Mm -hmm. uh, you use the word inactive DNA, there's, a, there's another fancier name for uh, it, I forget what yeah, it is. I, I, I can't remember uh, But I think 
for the most part, uh, the uh, DNA hybridization experiment that I showed earlier, uh, the, the, the fact that you can form chimpanzee and human DNA uh, regardless of whether it's active or inactive, uh, I think that goes to your point, I would say, and I'm looking up there as if he's up there. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, I think that goes to your point in that it's 98% of active and inactive. Because the re reason I brought that up is, is I figured that was evidence for evolution, the fact that we even have inactive coding it is. in exactly. our DNA. Why would it be there if we were designed and if the DNA's only purpose was to make specifically human beings? Exactly. exactly. You know, in fact, there are cases, uh, the, the one of the most well-known examples is that in horses, where some of their, what is now inactive DNA, sometimes gets turned on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get it's horses, for example, born with toes farther up from their hooves. And if you go back and look at the uh, uh, geologic evidence as far as how horses have evolved, indeed, they have evolved from originally a five-toed creature up until the one-toed creature. And every once in a while, you get these atavistic mutations, signs of their past evolutionary history appearing. That's right. That DNA is still there. It's just not being turned on. There are controlled genes that turn on and off uh, the DNA. And the DNA is really like a recipe anyway. It's not like, uh, it's not like there's one section of, of a strand of DNA that makes for blonde hair. Yeah, it's it's a recipe more like than uh, than a than a blueprint. Sometimes it's called a blueprint, but really a recipe is a better analogy. The real reason I brought it up is many people tell me if if I stress the point that uh, chimps and, and humans are 99% the same, they'll just say, "Oh well, God decided to make an animal 99% the same of us." But that does not explain all these uh, un unused codes being the same. Why would God do that? It would be to specifically well, uh, trick us. And another example, why would God create this protein and keep it exactly the same, but these other proteins, uh, why, why bother introducing this variation if the variation isn't necessary? Whereas natural selection and mutations that occur at random rates, that will account for the variation. Mm -hmm. uh, why would God decide, okay, all these proteins are the same, because they're all very crucial, but these proteins, uh, I'll put a bunch of variety in there just for fun. I mean, it's, ridic <laughs> it's ridiculous. He's I mean, going to go to all that to kind it. of trouble. I wish he'd fix the potholes in my street. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, well, thank you. Thanks, Arlo. I always appreciate your input. All right, let's uh, try Keith. Hi. Uh, good hi. morning. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to thank you for addressing the topic of evolution in this sort of a forum, uh, because you see a lot of creationists going in and you know, presenting their evidence, uh, which is mainly rhetorical rather than scientific. Excellent point. And then saying that, well, scientists won't talk to us, won't debate this issue. Uh, and so it's just it's nice to see someone presenting the scientific evidence in a straightforward manner for the public and trying to explode a lot of the myths which are out there, some of which are being created by the uh, opponents of evolution. Uh, yeah, there's a creation science uh, oh. here in <laughs> Texas somewhere. Well, the Institute of Creation Science, which was uh, formed, oh, how long ago? 20, 30 yeah, years ago, like where their sole mission is to um, uh, act as a proponent for creation science, or for creation, trying to find little bits of evidence that have a, a little bit of a scientific feel to them and craft them in a such a way to, to bolster their claim that, what, 6,000 years right. ago, 4,000 years ago. Are you talking uh, about the Institute of Creation, Creation Research? Research? In fact, yes. to join that organization, you have to sign yes. an oath stating that you have a, a, a belief in the literal interpretation of the Bible. So that that's hardly scientific. Yeah. Yeah. And if I may add, if the caller is looking for some more information about it, there, go to a good bookstore, go to the biology evolution section, and you'll find lots of good books explaining uh, not only evolution, but some of the tactics of the uh, creation science people. Uh, this is uh, a book that I find very helpful. It's called Evolution and the Myth of Creationism. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Evolution and the Myth of Creationism, a basic guide to the facts and the evolution debate. Uh, a book that uh, not only describes evolution in layman's terms, but also uh, includes some of the common uh, claims made by creationists some of their out, outlandish ideas and uh, basically tears it to shreds. We covered up the author's name there. Oh, I'm that, sorry. That, that's uh, all right. The, 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 I just thought we'd give the author credit. The there. author's name is Tim M. Barra. Yeah. And th aside from this, there are probably 20, 30 good books out there as and John's well. John's got one too, as a matter of fact. I can hold it up to the, the camera. Maybe they can zoom in. It's called Scientists Confront Creationism. Oh, here we go. 
and it's actually a collection of writings from different uh, scientists that take on different claims made by creationists. Most of the creationist stuff is basically misquotes, misinformation, the same old lies repeated often enough until people actually think there's some validity to it. If you repeat something that's not true often enough, and, and they do, uh, then people end up thinking, well, there must be something to it because they keep saying it for a hundred years. Yeah. All right. That's not necessarily the case. Anything else? Um, no, that's pretty much it. All right, we appreciate you calling and appreciate you viewing there. Uh, we're here every Sunday morning, 9 a.m., Channel 16. We're live every week. Uh, and then what, we'll go, this give me a chance to remind everyone, we, and when we're done here, we go to the Hot Jumble Bakery down at West 5th and Lavaca. And <coughs> we have a... We can come down and if you can't get your question on the phone today, because the phone looks been pretty packed here, you can come down and uh, meet John and Jim in person. Actually, I won't be there. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim's not going to be there this week. <laughs> Mike played 11:30, and I, I can't yes, miss the yes. Sorry. Minnesota, yes, go Minnesota. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm hoping Minnesota. I don't care who between Denver and the Jets there, but it, it'd be nice to see. Well, as there. long as Randy Moss and Chris Carter pray real hard to their God, I'm sure the Vikes will, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure the Vikes will, will win. Yeah, that's oh. what does it, huh? Yeah, can I throw a question at y'all? Sure. Hey, we have a question from the floor here. Go ahead, Don. What is the concept of punctuated equilibrium and can y'all say anything about you it? Want that yeah, I'll take that one. Go ahead and repeat the question. Uh, yeah. the, the question is, what, what is punctuated equilibrium? And, and Don was asking if we could say something about that. Punctuated equilibrium was an idea. Uh, by uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge in the early 70s, and what they what they were trying to show was that a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of organisms, a lot of species, stay pretty much the same during the time that they're in existence, and then they become extinct, and they're replaced by some other species, and that new species actually come into existence relatively quickly, geologically quickly, that is, and. Uh, and then they stay the same. That's the it's, that's the equilibrium part is it's staying the same. Uh, and other scientists uh, disagreed with with this idea. And there was a number of different ways that, that idea was being interpreted. Some people were interpreting this idea of punctuated equilibrium as like a replacement for normal Darwinian natural selection, which it isn't. And a lot of times people hear punctuated equilibrium and they think. Oh, that must be some alternative to all the stuff we've been talking about. All punctuated equilibrium is is natural selection. It's just after the species is is there, it basically doesn't change. And when it does change, or when the new species forms, it's going to be at the edges of that range of the population, and it's going to happen in a small, isolated pocket of organisms where the genetic change can move rapidly through the population. You have to be careful when you say move rapidly through the population. It makes it sound like somehow the DNA jumps out of one animal into <laughs> another one. <laughs> yeah, and good. Really what this means is over the years as this population uh, exists and organisms are born and die, uh, those organisms that are better adapted to a new environment now have a better chance of surviving long enough to produce offspring. That's the key. It's not just that they live. They have to live long enough to produce offspring at a higher rate than the other organisms that don't have these new traits. There's there's other scientists that I've read that uh, that, that punctuated link you will ever in there actually supports evidence towards catastrophic catastrophic events that right. have occurred like asteroids hitting or something to that effect right. major change. And, and and one of Stephen Jay Gould's uh, main ideas is that the, the history of life on Earth is very contingent on different accidents of history. Yes. For instance, um, uh, if it was in fact a, a meteorite that had wiped out the dinosaurs and other things at the end of the Cretaceous period, well, it's not that mammals are here because they're better, because they're better adapted, because they deserve to be around be more than dinosaurs or reptiles. It's just because, for whatever reason at the time, those mammals survived, those mammal ancestors survived while the dinosaurs were wiped out. So you don't really get this progression from simple to complex like you sometimes see with a cell and then it goes becomes a fish and then it becomes an amphibian and then it becomes uh, a reptile. You know, reptile and then it becomes uh, a, a, a Chinese military guy or <laughs> <laughs> harp on that but anyway the point uh, is that it's not really this linear progression it's, it's a lot of jumps and starts it's much more complex than than, uh, than sometimes it's portrayed yes uh, excellent uh, I'm looking forward to, to this. Can we go ahead and hit this? Let's go ahead and hit this, and we'll take a call. Yeah. Uh, what this uh, picture shows, maybe we can get a close-up on that. This picture shows um, 
structures, uh, the ear structures, and the history of the ear structures. Um, we have bone, little bones in our ears, and these bones, their, and their history, shows that they are actually gill arch supports in jawless fish originally. Hmm. And the jawless fish uh, had used these to help with their, with their breathing. And they didn't have ears. Fish don't have ear bones. Uh, and then the jawed fish, the, actually the jaw, what that is is a modification to this basic structure. And the way evolution works is it has to work on structures that are there. One of the greatest pieces of evidence supporting the whole idea of, of natural selection, evolution, the history of life on Earth as we understand it comes from the fact that organisms are not perfectly designed. You often hear that a bird's wing is a perfect design, a fish is perfectly designed. It, that's simply not the case. Evolution could only work on the structures that were there at the time. Uh, they didn't just pop into existence. So what we have here at the top we have here at the top is we have the gill arches, and then it, it's hard to see on here, but these, these same bones that are here in the jawed fish holding up the skull, and as a skull support here, later on in mammal-like reptiles, these bones had duplicated, had a gene had turned on uh, that had caused in the development of it, embryonic development of this organism to duplicate this particular structure. And then with that redundant structure, it was there to help transmit sound into the animal's skull and that helped it survive, that was a benefit to it. And then once that structure is there now, uh, it, natural selection kind of honed it and improved on it until we now have the, uh, the, the ear structure that we have in mammals and, and of course humans too. As oversimplifying here, but I'm kind of... But that's like uh, And the human ear is not the most advanced ear. No, no. that's far from it. No. Yeah, there's, there's, there's so that, that's the point, is that we're not leading up to right. the most complicated. Exactly. That's right, there's, uh, there's other animals that have better hearing, better vision, better, you know, just about everything. Uh, so let me grab the next thing. Sure. And that is the homologous structures. This is another very important line of evidence supporting the whole idea of the relatedness of these different organisms. If you look at the arm bones, uh, the front foreleg bones of uh, these different organisms. We have an elephant, a sea lion, a wolf, a possum, uh, a human, a mole, bat. All these animals have the same basic bones. They have the same uh, the scapula, the shoulder blade, the humerus, the, the long bone on the top of your arm, the ulna and radius in the, in the forearm. And these different organisms, the different bones are different lengths because their genetic makeup uh, in the embryo stage uh, the, the genes had these bones growth turned on for varying lengths of time relative to other parts of the body. And so you get these different shaped animal, but it's, it's the same basic animal. It's the same basic body plan. These are variations on a theme. And that is an extremely important line of evidence supporting the whole idea that we're related. There, there's really no other good explanation for why we have the same bones as an opossum. Why does an elephant have the same bones as an opossum? An elephant has to carry so much more weight. You know, if you're going to sit down and design an elephant, <laughs> I, I don't think you'd use these all these little bones. It's really messy. <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd have something. You'd have a better system than that. If you take a close look at the bat, right. what uh, we view as the wing of the bat and the structures that support it are actually the fingers right. of, of the uh, bat's hand, which support most of the wing. Uh, same bones that are in our hand and our arms. Right, and some in some cases, some of these bones fuse together in the embryo yeah. stage, and there's some of that going on. But when you look at the embryos developing, you can see these changes. You can see how they grow at different rates. You end up with a vastly look different looking uh, organism. And we'll, we'll go ahead and hit this right now. This is a picture of uh, a picture of three different organisms: a chimpanzee, uh, a human, and the middle um, picture there is, is the hip bone, and uh, and the, uh, the femur for a uh, Australopithecine. Uh, Australopithecine uh, is thought right now to be one of our ancestors dating to about three and a half million years ago living in East Africa. And this skull right here, in fact, this, uh, I'll hold this one up. Maybe I can get a good picture of that. This skull right here is a skull of, an well, not actual Australopithecus. <laughs> I wouldn't be holding it here. Uh, I would, we wouldn't have it. <laughs> uh, that'd be extremely rare and valuable. It's a replica. It's a, it's a, it's a plaster a replica. But it shows the basic structure. And it shows some pretty <coughs> important things on here. Uh, 
which we, we, we can get to talk about pretty quickly. Um, Sorry. <laughs> this, this, this shows right here uh, evidence that uh, our ancestors four million years ago, three and a half million years ago or so, were able to walk upright. And, and that chimpanzees cannot walk upright for long periods of time due to their bone structure. Uh, humans, of course, can. Uh, but the Australopithecine ancestor also could walk upright. And we know that because of the bone structure. Also, uh, they found footprints that w we think are from that same species. Of course, you don't, you know, th there could be the possibility there's another species that made those footprints, but that is not the current view. Should we go ahead and get a, get a Sure, call? but uh, yeah. uh, Joe actually hung up, I think. Uh, he's no longer on the line. I have Howard and Bill. Uh, three's not there either. So would, you want to go to two? Howard. Bill. 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 Uh, yeah, Bill. Bill, sorry. A uh, couple of Thank simple you. questions. I, I really enjoy this stuff. Did you all discuss at all the impact of different species? I mean, what separates the species and how they combine, for instance, isn't it the leopard and the jaguar that can mate, or, and, and uh, the horse and the donkey to create a mule, is it? There I, was a recent I get example of uh, llamas and camels. Could, could crossbreed, and they got a thing they they dubbed a camel. Uh, what point are you trying to make? I'm, and, I'm sure I, I haven't got your point. Can a camel then go ahead and and uh, also reproduce, or That's and, and, and how how do you use those uh, facts, very real ones that we see in the world every day around us, in terms of the whole evolution uh, theory and so on? Well, those are very closely related species. Lions and tigers, they can cross them. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they produce viable offspring. In other words, offspring that can reproduce themselves. I'm not really sure on that point. But uh, but th they're just closely related species that have not been separated that long, and so still have enough similarities that they can Good. they can breed. It fits. It doesn't. It it fits in with the whole picture that we're, yeah. we're talking are about. Are you are you trying to say like some people, and I'm not sure if you're the one trying are trying to use that as the differentiating between species is if they can't breed and it's a different species? Is that the direction? Well, I'm, I'm asking scientifically. I, I'm okay. actually not even trying to, to project an opinion or anything other than uh, we Spe see species, I mean, the, the development where where th they breed and some can go on and continue to breed and others can't. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious in everyday life. Right. Well, I except that it's not really that obvious because who would have guessed that you could cross a camel and a llama? You know, they don't even look that much alike. Spe species, I mean... A species is a, a classification we impose on something, right. you know, and yeah. usually yeah. it's pretty clear, because usually, you know, the group has been interbreeding, you know, off by itself long enough that it's distinct. But it's not always. Uh, it, 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 you can have cases where you have things that are visually distinct that can still interbreed, interbreed if their DNA is still similar enough, and you have other cases where things that do look reasonably similar can't interbreed because they're they're other. Other parts of their DNA that don't have to do with how they look have de uh, deviated far enough that you can't cross them. And apparently a lion and a tiger without the skin on are very, very difficult to tell apart. <laughs> the basic bone structure is identical, and you have to look at other things than that to tell actually which animal you're looking at. Uh, anything else, Caller? Oh, uh, a whole different one if, if you're up for it, and that's sure. how humans stand out so much. I mean... I imagine with all the millions of species, there must be others, but humans is part of the mammal family and so on. So many other mammals are similar. For instance, uh, camels and llamas or lions and tigers or rats and, and mice. And um, I just find it interesting that humans don't have another uh, another species that's so much like what enough. What about our primates? Well, no, well, I understand... The the, chim I, the chimpanzees I understand are... The finger structure and so on, but in terms of intelligence and so on, and it wouldn't surprise me that over, I don't know, pick the X number of years, that there would be groups of different humanoid-type species that well, would eventually evolve. There were and, in and the in past. Fact, and um, <sighs> getting into the ethical and metaphysical stuff of this and brings up questions about genetic in engineering and so on. I, I, it, please allow me to paraphrase that. I think what he's saying, uh, and it's an interesting question, uh, do we have enough evidence to say that every human that's now living is all direct ancestor to one, that n another branch of ours didn't evolve 
enough yeah, that so close that we would actually have. We're all one species. Oh, we do have we're enough evidence. We to are one species. By, by the standard of being able to interbreed. We're exactly. All one species. We're all one species. And viable young from that interbreed. But if you were to go back two million years ago in the past, there were actually two different species of hominids. Hominids being there us, our direct ah, ancestors, okay. and side okay. branches, yes. and Thank maybe you. even three. Depending upon, you know, you, the, the, the people that study this get into great big debates about how they interpret the fossil evidence this way and that way, and it's very intense uh, in, in that field. But there were, the common understanding is that there were two, two, at least two different species two million years ago walking around. One of them that led to us, and the other one that had become extinct. Excellent question. Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal. No, I was thinking of, oh yeah, that was another one actually, Neanderthals. They, they mm -hmm. saw that as being separate, but they were more recent. I was thinking of the uh, uh, Australopithecus uh, oh. Robustus. Robustus. The, the, okay. That's, they changed the name, but that's the one we're talking about. <laughs> they changed the names on these as they reclassify them. You have to keep up with it or you, you get left behind. <laughs> so, so apparently that, that does happen, right. or has happened in our past, and you know, it's a good question why we don't have more, uh, sub uh, more species of intelligent upright hominids now. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, my, my personal guess, and I'm, I'm not a scientist, so just take this as my opinion. Um, my personal guess is once you've got something that was as um, as successful as us, we just took over the planet. You know, <laughs> yeah. You'd have to have gotten two things as successful as us pretty much in a very short period of time for them to both grab uh, half the planet and, and hang on to it. That was an excellent question. Uh, anything else? No, keep up the good work, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. We'll, we'll try one more caller. Howard? 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 Oh, yeah. Good morning. How you doing? Excellent. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to confirm the guy in the dark blue shirt when he was looking at the uh, mm -hmm. embryos, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, uh, when I was in England, they uh, this was back in the 60s, they had a, we had a teacher that was a scientist also, a professor, and he had photographs of uh, children born with uh, th two or three inch tails and they had to amputate them. It's, could you confirm that for me? Well, in fact, uh, I've not seen, but I've heard that that's not all that uncommon. Uh, oftentimes when a baby is born in, in a hospital, uh, if indeed there is that small extension from the tail bones, uh, it's not all that uncommon for the doctor just to you know, snip it off, it heals up, as, and you really can't tell that that ever did occur. Now, whether it's one out of a 1,000, one out of 10,000 births, I can't tell you. Uh, it apparently, is, it's, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's not that uncommon. Yes. And in fact, yeah, I had, we were talking about this in class, what, two years ago, and a kid in class said that they were born with a tail. And we did not confirm that there on the spot. But <laughs> <laughs> I, just I, for the scar. I, just, I don't know. I just wanted to make sure that we're real clear on that point. That we didn't yeah. check that, but that's what they said. But it's just a simple extension of a few of the, the last uh, vertebrae. Right. I, I heard, I, you know, I was just more or less confirming that they, there is such things that we did have tails at one time, and that was probably just uh, as it was coming through the birth process, it probably just obviously kept it on, you know. And but you can see where it'd be an advantage not to have a tail was, uh, uh, for us or what. Uh, I, but I also see where the apes, you, uh, what's the ambidextric tail or whatever? The uh, prehensile. prehensile. Prehensile, that's the word, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, that. That would come in handy too, I guess. And, <laughs> and, it's, and it's also serves as a, a, a function for balance, balance goal. Exactly. And, but yeah. none of the old world monkeys have tails. No. It's only the new world monkeys that had, that had, the monkey group had been covering the entire, you know, North uh, Africa and South America, and Africa and South America split apart due to plate tectonics and rafted apart. And so, for whatever reasons or accidents or adaptive value, we may never know, but. Uh, it, it, it ended up that only New World monkeys have tails, that right. is, South American monkeys. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your call. Oh, <coughs> also, um, sure. I was going to ask you something else. Sure. Uh, in, uh, there's the gentleman that called earlier about the fact that uh, there's no other human beings, you know, uh, alike, you know, so to speak. Um, I, f I remember in, in that there was a, um, an article on about in South Africa they had found some Neanderthals and they were closely uh, linked to the, you know, uh, uh, the Homo sapiens, that they were in the same time level as each other. Mm -hmm. So I guess what happened was we just probably decided to uh, 
take over and kick their ass. And <laughs> that's basically what we were saying there earlier. Yes. That's, that's, that would be but they they did they did have evidence of them living at the same time period, and they said it was like 800,000 years ago. Yes, and that's a real mystery as to why two species would be able to live at all next to each other, and they found that evidence of that in Europe too, where mm -hmm. these two species <coughs> seem to be separate Middle species. <coughs> Excuse me. And the question is, how do they manage to pull that off? Because most of the time, species go head to head. Like you say, and one of them loses. So. Right. Well, that, that's <coughs> what I, you know. Um, I I understand Neanderthal was a lot stronger, but I think it's probably because of our intelligence that we uh, booted them out, so to speak. That's a commonly held hypothesis or explanation for that. Yeah. And the, I other, appreciate the other question I was sure. going to ask sure. was um, when I was in England, uh, you've heard stories of these fine uh, uh, knights of shining armor, six foot and all this stuff well um, what, you know if you ever go there and you look at some of the shining armor they're only about five foot six so <laughs> there is some there is some evidence that it's our diet that uh, you know produces exactly. us makes us taller and everything the way we eat and um, I think that's some kind of ev uh, evolution don't you well in a way yes well like I mean, the, the improved diet just allows for the potential to be better filled yeah. or fulfilled. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. It doesn't really change the genetic makeup. Yeah, the potential has always yeah. been there. Yeah. It's just now we're taking advantage of that potential. Exactly. Excellent point. Okay, then. You have a great day. And you, thanks, thanks a lot. Can I, can I get Mary it's here? Mary, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's about our last call. Mary? Hi. Excellent. Hi, Mary. I finally got in. <laughs> you I get to be our last caller today. Right. Well, this was a great show. Thanks, John um, thank and Jim. You. Thank, thank you. Yeah. I mean, thank you. You, guys made it, you guys made it accessible even to some of the more inadequate minds we have <laughs> around. No, but no, they no. do that for a living. They, uh, being a teacher well, like that, do. they can... Yeah. Well, I wish you'd been my teacher. <laughs> <There, yeah. laughs> better than what I had. Anyway, what I wanted to say is sure. that my biggest problem with all of it is the fear factor, okay? And what you're doing here is giving us knowledge. And knowledge is the greatest weapon against fear. Because knowledge, every little bit of knowledge I gain makes me less afraid and makes me more comfortable with what I don't know. You know, Excellent. I'm not threatened by that like other people are. I don't need a big daddy to take care of me because I feel like I've got the faculties to do it for myself. And I really appreciate the help you're giving me. I missed your show last Sunday. I really feel bad about it. Someday when we're older, maybe I can get a tape of it and watch uh, it at home on my VCR. Uh, call, call our voicemail number and uh, uh, we'll set up something with our voicemail. There it is. 371 oh, I your voicemail number. Just because I don't call it doesn't mean I don't know it. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, Thanks I, for listening to me, okay? I'm sure I can work something out for you, Mary. All and thanks for being there. You're very welcome. Bye. You have a great week. Okay, just to remind everybody, this show has been brought to you by Atheist Community of Austin. That's our voicemail. Uh, we're heading down to the bagel shop as soon as we leave here. It's West 5th and Lavaca. We had our website up there earlier. Kellen Von Hauser does a great job on the, on the website there. I'd like to thank John Coons, Jim Halmack for a great show today. Thank you. As you can see, we, 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 we didn't get to everything. We had <laughs> other panels, that, other pictures there to get to and everything else so we're uh we want to we thank austin thank all you callers and you got a few seconds here would you guys like to say anything uh no <laughs> okay <laughs> just keep on evolving keep, i guess keep on evolving. <laughs> this, this i want to make a final comment that out loud too. Yeah, can i make a final comment feel free Did you notice whenever only when we have experts about evolution on the show the creationists don't call <laughs> in about evolution. excellent point Hey, go ahead and read that out loud if you it want. It says, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And that was said by Theodosius Dobzhansky. And that is very true. Evolution is one of the most important ideas in science. And it is one of the things that ties together all the other ideas in biology. And if you're in school and if your teachers aren't teaching it, demand it. Demand it. It needs to be in the curriculum. It is in the curriculum. They're breaking the law by not presenting it. That's right. Excellent finish. You in it right on it? Uh, <laughs> That was fun. That was right. I enjoyed that. Yeah, it was good. I, I stumbled a little bit at the beginning, I think, but then well, I think I warmed up. Oh, you did fine. Oh, well, you did good. left that you guys didn't get to? That's no, right. I just, really actually, this is the last one. I oh, was it? Oh, you know, oh, okay. That's all right. You just wet their appetites. Yeah. Yeah.